Hi, my name is Megan, and this is Everything Lit. Today, I am bringing you the first in a new vlog series that I'm going to do throughout the year called I Like Big Books. Um, you know, like, I like big books and I cannot lie. So, it is just a vlog where I read one book, but it is a big book. And today's book is The Memoirs of Cleopatra by Margaret George, hence the look. Um, I don't pretend to be good at makeup, I don't do it often, but I thought I'd have some fun with it, you know. So, I will be reading this book. It took me all of February, spoiler alert, and this is about the life of Cleopatra, as if it's her memoirs. Uh, it's historical fiction, obviously, and this was actually published in 1997, so it's an older book. I'll see you again at the end because I'm about to film the final part, the final thoughts. The first update of this new vlog series, I guess, called I Like Big Books, The Memoirs of Cleopatra. Oh boy. All right, I am about 40 pages in. Do you know how long it took me to read those 40 pages? like an hour. I'm reading this so slow. So I got the audiobook. Um, I like resubscribed to Kobo Audio to get the audiobook for $10 instead of 40. And the audiobook is interesting. Um, the narrator has a British accent. She sounds like an older woman, which is not exactly how I picture Cleopatra, especially when in this section, in the very beginning, we start when she's very young. So it's, uh, I'm gonna listen to it because I think it will be quicker. I did the math and it would take me roughly 25 hours of focused reading to finish this. And you know, if you watch some other booktubers, you might think, oh, 25 hours, that's not too bad. That's like one weekend. N no, I have a full-time job. That is all month. So we'll see if the audiobook picks up the pace. Let's talk about, um, I have actually read the first hundred pages of this in the past, uh, but I don't remember any of it at all. Interesting. I wouldn't say it's good yet. It's very detailed. I mean, it's called The Memoirs of Cleopatra, so it's her whole life. We start the book when she is like three and her mother dies, her mother drowns uh, outside the palace in their like little lake. It's a very traumatic experience. It keeps coming back even in these first 40 pages. It very much shapes book Cleopatra as a child because now she's afraid of the water. Her first real memory is of being like ripped away from her mother and held down so she doesn't try to jump in after her. That's all I really have because I've only read 40 pages. Yeah, I'll update you. Maybe in a hundred pages, maybe every hundred pages, I'll give an update because she thick. It's like 950 pages. That's the plan. Now, last night I did put on a like ancient Egypt ambiance room. It was like ancient Egyptian garden. That was fun. And I do like reading the book when I'm in it, but then I like have to go to bed and I've only read 10 pages and it's been a half an hour. It's like, yikes. When I'm in it, I'm in it, I'm enjoying it, but we're gonna give the audiobook a shot and see if that gets us a little further, a little quicker, you know? I am 120 pages into this. I've been listening to the audiobook and reading physically, going back and forth, and like I am only a, one ninth of the way through this book and so much has happened. So it starts when Cleopatra is like three, talked about the death of her mother, and then when she's seven, and now she is 18, Julius Caesar has come into the picture. I think we're in the middle of the first Alexandrian War and it's Caesar versus some of Cleopatra's relatives, like other Egyptian royals. I don't know this era of history and like the battles that took place. So I'm just going with the flow, going with the book. Somehow, even though we're 
in a war with battles, it's kind of boring. <laughs> How did that happen? Like, the strategy is slightly talked about, but Cleopatra is 18 and we're, she's our point of view. And so she's like watching ships burning and seeing Caesar come back to her. And then like, also, I feel like there's a lot of like f f faded destiny. Like they're very much enamored of each other very quickly. And I don't like... I don't know. I just wish it would have been built up a little more. He's, God, he's 52 and she's 18. Like, I know this is like historically what happened. But like, I don't want to read about it. I don't know. I, some people might be like, Megan, why are you still reading it then? DNF it. This has been on my TBR for so long though, that DNFing it feels like like giving up, like surrender. I like this author. I liked the other book I read. I just think that I need to get further into this and I will sink into it. I'm already enjoying it more than I did the first couple sections. And I think I'm hitting the area that I stopped reading it at before. Like I remember the stuff with Caesar from before. She thick though, I figure. If I read like 40-ish pages a day, I should be done by the end of the month. That's like on top of any other reading I'm doing. I think Caesar is set up very interestingly. Um, he's very humanized while also being like a great general and a strategist and shown as brutal and unforgiving. And like a lot of people have died already. I feel like this first part, she's 18, Cleopatra, she's like first love is Caesar and I feel like in this part she's like learning a lot from him and then we're gonna see that later in her how she keeps the Egyptian throne and her her own machinations I'll update you in uh, another hundred pages so probably a couple days from now it is sooner than I thought it would be to do this update Vino is here. If you hear him crying or purring, he very much wants to play. But I am 229 pages into the memoirs of Cleopatra. I listened to the audiobook a lot on Monday. Now it's Tuesday and I've listened to the audiobook a little bit, but if I stick to my schedule, I still have to read 20 pages of this tonight. But I just wanted to read some quotes, talk about, you know, I mean, I'm a quarter of the way through, you know, I'm like 225. So let's talk about it. Um, I'm really liking it. I thought that this would be kind of like me justifying why I'm not DNFing it, but I'm actually really enjoying it. About 150, there was a quote that I, I was listening to and I like wrote it down and had to come find it in the book. So in this scene, Cleopatra is having a a coin made of her and her newborn son. He's like only a month or two old and she wants this coin made of her and her baby at her chest. She has this coin maker like draw up a clay sculpture or whatever, a clay thingamabob. She sees it for the first time and is like, oh, is that what I look like? Like, why did you make me look like this? And basically he made her look older. He made her look ugly instead of capturing her features the way they are. And this is what Cleopatra thinks about it. She says, so I'll just, I'll read a little bit of context. Like she's basically telling the sculpturist, the clay master, the image taker that like, why did you do this? He says, I thought you wanted to stress the dignity of the throne. And she says, I do, but size and age do not automatically confer greatness. He says, forgive me, but I thought you were being a woman that it would be better. I mean, and then he kind of cuts off. And here's the, here's the line that I really care about or the paragraph. It says, I knew what he meant. For unknown reasons, if one wished to show that a woman was powerful or intelligent, the way to signify it was to portray her as being physically unattractive. For a man, however, it was the opposite. 
Alexander's beauty was not felt to detract from his generalship. Nowhere was it hinted that a handsome man could not be a good ruler or clever or strong or brave. In fact, people longed for a resplendent king. But for a woman? I shook my head. It was as if beauty in a woman rendered all other traits suspect. That last line is what I wrote down. It was as if beauty in a woman rendered all other traits suspect. Ah. Like, that whole paragraph, love that. Especially with, like, all the rumors about Cleopatra. People say she was a great beauty. People say she was ugly and they didn't understand what hold she had on people. People say she was conniving. People say that she was just, like, that she just slept with powerful men. Like, there are so many rumors about Cleopatra. And, of course, this is fiction. It's not going to answer any of them. But seeing Margaret George's take on this and seeing a version of Cleopatra that puts all these pieces together is really enjoyable. Maybe toward the end of the video I'll compare it to other books I've read like this uh, because last year I read Earthly Joys by Philippa Gregory who at this around the same time as Margaret George I read their books and I was really into historical fiction and like juicy heavy historical fiction but something about that one I just could not get on board with. And I don't know if it was the male narrator. I don't know if it was the emphasis on loyalty and faith. Like, I don't know. That's one quote that I loved. Another one um, happens just a couple pages later. So in this section, she's just dealt with a bunch of advisors. She's getting advice on how to deal with the Nile rising. It's causing a lot of issues because the water is just wiping away everything. She says, the truth is I found it a trial to be pleasant all the time. Perhaps I am not naturally a pleasant person. And then she says, no, I think it is more that I need a certain amount of privacy every day, a few minutes completely alone, in the same way I need food or sleep. Just as everyone's need for food and sleep varies, so apparently does everyone's need for privacy. I have noticed that some people seem never to have an instant to themselves, and their humor is none the worse for it. I envy those people, but I am not one of them. Like, tell me Cleopatra's an introvert without telling me Cleopatra's an introvert. There was another part, but I couldn't really find it, where she and Caesar have just been reunited after like a year and a half apart, and the way that their scene together was described was so epic in the way of like an epic story. It was so like life or death and cosmic like souls. It was just fantastic. The writing in this, it takes, it took a while for me to get like sucked into it because I would say the first 60 pages I was like oh my gosh how am I gonna read this whole book and now I'm like I'm in it I'm 225 pages in and I'm ready I'm in it for the long haul and this is one of the things that I just I think Margaret George does so well they draw you into the character's life so deeply and into their brain that you can't help but care for them and root for them and want to see how this young woman at 23 becomes the Cleopatra that everyone whispers about and how she ends up um you know I think she poisons herself right and so like getting from this point where she's visiting Rome for the first time to that is I'm in it for the journey so I took a couple notes I've talked about how she was apparently an introvert the thing with giant historical novels like this especially the further back they go, the more I trust that the author has done their research and is constructing a character as true to life as they can. So like that line that I read shows that she's she was an introvert before they had a word for that, right? It's so much easier now to be like, oh, so-and-so was an introvert. And of course, good writing wouldn't just tell us that. But the character would have those thoughts, perhaps, if we were in their head, they would be like, oh, I'm an introvert, so I needed to, like, get out of this situation. Or I'm an extrovert, so I wanted to go out and dance. Like, people are more aware of that now and their own abilities and psyches and whatever. Her being a businesswoman, Cleopatra at one point goes on this trip to Nubia, somewhere in Africa. I don't remember and the queen there wanted to suggest an all-female alliance and that was very cool and Cleopatra turned her down. I'm hoping that comes back around. I feel like it 
it might, right? It might. Could I Google this and Google Cleopatra's life and her history and just figure out most of this? Yeah, I could, but that would take away the suspense. When she goes into this guest room, she looks at like the quality of the wood and then the silver that they have, because silver is harder to come by in Egypt than gold. And she starts thinking about trade routes and like it shows how intelligent she was, how much of a businesswoman she was, how she understood the running of her country without like telling us that. She is showing us all of those things through the narrative. And that's why this book is 900 pages. Episode one of this is going really great. I like big books and yeah, I sure do. Another update on the memoirs of Cleopatra by Margaret George. I am pretty far into it. I'm about 363 pages in, so I've got quite a chunk left, but 363 pages and I am greatly enjoying the audiobook, I have to say. I know I gave it crap at first for the narrator sounding like an older woman, but one, this is told from the point of view of an older Cleopatra looking on her life, so that makes sense, and two, she is really good at accents. She does a couple accents in here and it's just really good. What has happened since I last updated you? Well a lot because I've read like 110 pages. Cleopatra was actually in Rome when Caesar was killed. Did not know that. That tells you I've gotten to the part where Caesar has just been murdered in the Senate. It's the Ides of March, the 15th of March. And it's crazy to me that we still know about that day and that date and that like betrayal i don't know i mean like history we know a lot about history there are a lot of written records but just the way that this day has stuck with the public consciousness and this betrayal by all of his friends incredible this book certainly takes a kinder view of caesar because it's from cleopatra's point of view in this book she's in love with him she I, historically she did have his child so there's a lot of emotion in there she does recognize that he had tendencies to like do too much to want too much and that he was trying to like conquer everything which like we know is not great but for the roman people like they loved that shit um there was also some really interesting commentary about how the romans loved blood sport which we have the historical receipts. They loved seeing battles reenacted and putting people in arenas to die. Seeing it from Cleopatra's point of view as an Egyptian coming to Rome and seeing all of these blood sports is really upsetting to her and harrowing and she thinks the Roman people take death too lightly. And I think that's very interesting, especially because Caesar at one point tells her, well, I think Egyptians take death too seriously and they revere it too much. So very cool stuff. I definitely, this is, you know, a book that you want to sink into. You want to be part of that world. And I'm sure I've talked about it before, but Margaret George's writing makes me forget what I know about history. I wasn't sold on Caesar. Caesar did respect her and she did a lot for him in terms of political maneuvering and he did a lot for her in terms of winning her country back from her traitorous brother. I'm liking it and I'm learning quite a bit about ancient Rome and ancient Egypt. I've got new hair. Look at those bright pink streaks and then it fades into purple from the old stuff. Love it. So I am talking about this also. You see this? This is a giant, oh. this is a giant Cheeto pillow and I love it. So to the actual book I'm talking about, The Memoirs of Cleopatra, I am officially 461 pages in. We had the Ides of March, Caesar was killed, and then I feel like four years passed really quickly. We spent probably like 200 pages on Caesar and Rome and Cleopatra being in Rome and like those 200 pages were two years and then I feel like we just went over four years in like a hundred pages and it was a little disorienting because like so much was happening because like the Nile hadn't risen and it follows a lot of Cleopatra like dealing with governing her country and trying to get back at the conspirators that killed Caesar and then now like 
Like there was all this political stuff that I, it felt like the author had to get through the political stuff because this is a, you know, historical fiction novel and she wanted to cover all of these years. But now we've really slowed down and we are like luxuriating in her, in Cleopatra falling in love with Mark Antony and like their dinners and like, I feel like we've spent the last 40 pages on these like two or three nights. So the timing in this book, sorry, my arm is getting tired. Woo. So I feel like the timing in this book is just weird. Like the pacing is all kinds of off because of how large it is and how much span the author wants to cover. Um, I'm still liking it. I'm hoping to finish it this week, right? I've gotten halfway through and like, what's today? It's the 12th of February and I started on the 1st. So in 12 days, I've gotten halfway. But the first couple days, I was really struggling. So I'm thinking I should be able to finish this in the next 8 to 10 days, maybe sooner. I feel like the last 200 pages, two or 300, I've just rocketed through. It's so satisfying to be like halfway through a big chunky book like there's nothing like it and it's so engrossing like when I'm listening to this like, I'm in it I'm interested although I will say I did listen to like probably an hour of the audiobook yesterday while I was playing Super Mario uh Bowser's Fury I just I wanted to beat the game and I wanted to read at the same time and so I did Maybe some of the disorientation with the time span was because I was playing Mario while listening. It could, that could be, it could be a thing. But now my focus is on reading because I beat the game. So let's go. I'm back again for another update on the memoirs of Cleopatra. First of all, most important update, my bookmark, which is very cute. It says, reading is my escape to a better world. Um, Vino murdered the little tassel. Now it's just two little strings. How sad. Now the real update. I am about 600 pages into this book. I've got this much left, which is like 350 pages. So I am making my way through. I've hit a point where it's not that, like I'm kind of tired of it. It's very long. It's all in Cleopatra's point of view, all in her head. And as much as I've grown to like her, I've grown to like the journey and find her interesting, we've hit the part of the book where she's with Mark Antony. And if you know history, um, I don't know history, so I can't speak. <laughs> like, I haven't studied it. I, I don't know what is happening here. I don't know what's happening anywhere. So like, I can't speak to the history, but book Antony is kind of annoying. And you know what? I haven't even read the Antony and Cleopatra Shakespeare play. Like I'm just, I'm very much, I'm very much a Caesar girl, you know? Um, but in this book, genuinely of her two dalliances, of her two romances, I preferred Caesar, like low key. The man got shit done. You can't deny. Meanwhile, Mark Antony seems very good natured. And there's this um, running thread that Cleopatra's doctor, Olympos, who's one of her great friends, been there the whole book. He says that Mark Antony takes on the aspect or the personality of like whoever he's with. The stronger personality wins him over and he just goes with it and takes that personality on and goes with their whims and uh, like you see that happening in the book the way he is with cleopatra is different from when he's in rome so the way he is with different people it, like his nature changes and he when he was in rome he made jokes at cleopatra's expense but now they're married and he's like oh you're my one true love my one wife and it's like What's the truth here, bro? So I just feel like Cleopatra is like low key better off without him or could have found someone better. And I know like historically, this is what happened, but book wise, I'm annoyed and I don't care for him. So it's making it hard to read all these parts about like battles that are happening in other places and she's praying for his safe return. And on the one hand, he, he definitely like makes it through a lot of situations 
uh, in a lot of battles and shows his ingenuity. On the other hand, because we are so distanced from that, we're seeing everything through Cleopatra's point of view, he comes off like too trusting and naive and slightly incompetent, even though like in battle, he's not. I have about 18 hours in the audiobook left, I wanna say, and that's these 300 pages. Who would I recommend this to? I would recommend this to fans of historical, like long form historical fiction, maybe to fans of long memoirs, because it is like the memoirs of Cleopatra. This book came out in like the 90s right? 1997. So I guess the question becomes, with all the new releases out and the way the publishing world has changed, is this book worth going back for? I think yes. I, I mean, I'm not finished, but I'm glad that I have read this. I'm finally reading it and getting to it. I was able to teach some of my coworkers fun facts that St. Uh, Valentine's Day, which just passed, um, is based on Lupercalia, Lupercalia, uh, the ancient Roman holiday where people like whip each other with goat skins for fertility. So that was interesting and fun. And even though we're kind of distanced from like the big battles of ancient Rome, I feel like I am learning about ancient Egypt for sure. Cleopatra, a bit about Caesar and a bit about Mark Antony, right? The one thing I will say that makes this tough is the pacing. The pacing is confusing. You know, 50 pages will be one night and then another 50 pages will be like a year because of how long this book spans you have to figure out how to balance that pacing and i think it's a bit off in this and maybe this is this is one of her older works in terms of like what she wrote what she published i think helen of troy actually came after this one which is her other book that i've read but genuinely i loved helen of troy so much i bought every single other book Margaret George has written. I think there's only one that I don't have and that's her newest. Oh, you know, in ancient Egypt, oh, they had pet cats and they worshiped cats. Look at this boy. He'd be worshiped as a god. Look at his little leggy, what are you doing? I will update you probably in another hundred pages. Um, it's, today is uh, Wednesday and I'm hoping to finish this this weekend. Quick update, I am 758 pages in, I've got 200 pages to go, and at this point my interest is waning, I'm not gonna lie. We've gotten a lot more into battles and it's basically like Cleopatra versus Octavian in terms of like gossip and public opinion, and I don't care for Antony. I think he and Cleopatra, like his devotion to her at this point is something I appreciate and I like, but he was married to another woman the first five years that they were married. And he, while he was like loyal to Caesar and like a good dude, he's also kind of a drunken idiot at times. I just think that he brought a lot of trouble onto Cleopatra that he didn't need to. I know that Historically, people probably say the opposite because Rome is like the epicenter. So they say like Cleopatra, you know, tempted Mark Antony into this and like she is the one who seduced him and brought all these wars to him and made him like fight these battles. But this is Cleopatra's memoirs and so obviously I'm rooting for her. I've known her in this book world since she was seven so like she's she's my girl at this point but it is interesting after you know we've done all this character building of her very strategic mind, her um, ambition. It's interesting to see some of that and how it influences her and Mark Antony's relationship because she is the ambitious one. She wants her children to have empires to rule. And as someone who like was born to be a queen, like 
yeah, I guess that makes sense. Those 200 pages, I think a lot is going to happen. I also have kind of lost my grasp on the timing and how long that like how long things have been going on. I'm getting lost. I'm getting lost in the sauce of this big ass book. Today's Saturday, February 18th. So I'm hoping I can finish this this weekend, Monday at the very latest. I can't tell if I'm seeing my eyelashes because they're so long with the mascara or my eyebrows because they're so dark right now. All right, welcome to the end of the vlog. You've been with me for a while. It's been all month. I have finished the memoirs of Cleopatra. I finished it yesterday on audio. I listened to the last seven hours in a marathon listen. Um, I listened as I was at work. I listened while I was driving. I done did it. So what are my final thoughts? I mean, we all know how this ends. And yet somehow when it came to the ending, I was still surprised because Cleopatra and Mark Antony had gone through so much to get to that final point. It just felt like, how could they lose, you know? So that was really interesting. And it was one of the things that drew me to Margaret George because she writes these stories that people know so much about the characters already and still manages to surprise us. And I love that. How do I even talk about a 954 page journey? I listened to this on audio pretty much exclusively because it is so large, it is both tall and thick, that reading 10 pages took me 20 minutes. The ending really did have me emotional because Cleopatra worked throughout this novel so that her children could have the Egyptian throne and really everything she did was in the end either for Egypt or for her children or sometimes both. Here's the thing, Mark Antony at the end was kind of a bitch and I did not like him. I did not like him as a character and I think part of that might be that because this was about Cleopatra and this was from her point of view, a lot of those early battles and the things that made Mark Antony's name and made him such a wonderful leader were downplayed in this because she saw him as her husband and her lover and yes she mentions that like he was kind and he was a great speaker but uh I think the narrative didn't show the ways in which he was good at what he did and maybe he wasn't good at what he did because Cleopatra, she had to scheme to get some things done. I think one of the struggles of such a long book is that I get, you get, you care about Cleopatra. I don't care about anyone else. But when she met Caesar, you, I really felt in, in the novel, I'm not going to talk about like historically, but in the novel, you really felt that Caesar was her match, that they were matched in intelligence and strategy. And even though he was so much older than her, which is kind of like in real life, but she has had this mantle of power put on her. And so the age differential wasn't as big of a deal because they are both powerful people in their own right. And in fact, in some ways she was more powerful than him because she was the queen of Egypt and ran this territory, whereas he was still in the military. While he was like emperor of Rome, he was often on the military ventures. So it's not like he had a lot of hand in running the day-to-day -day of Roman life and running Rome as a country. Even though he conquered a lot of territory, he was not running that territory. So there's, there's a difference in power there that kind of made their age difference more palatable. And I think that in this book, as much as it is about Cleopatra, it was also a bit about Caesar's legacy. And that comes into play because she bore Caesar a son named Caesarian or little Caesar. So you couldn't not have Caesar as this overarching figure head in the story. And sort of he is elevated to a godlike status. The Romans worship him as a god. And so it was really interesting to see this point of view because I feel like we know the Julius Caesar of Shakespeare. The Julius Caesar who was cut down because he was going to be a dictator and he was evil and fascism and blah blah blah. It depends on the narrative that you have understood and read about these people because they were real people with all their flaws. I just found this book fascinating. 
it is editing Megan here just to I feel like I got lost a little bit in some of the talk about Caesar but one of the big issues I had with Mark Antony was I feel like the narrative didn't give me a reason for why I should root for him and Cleopatra to be together because it seemed like he was just kind of a drunken idiot and she had to put up with like some bullshit it I there was no reason for me to root for them puff and that's why I think I preferred Caesar because there were reasons for us to root for them. Even though she had like four kids with Mark Antony, I felt that she was downplaying herself. Now, at one point she does say that like, she loved Mark Antony as a man. Stop. It's hard to compare to Caesar because he was such a god and especially someone who is dead, you kind of gloss over all of their flaws. Caesar did really leave Cleopatra in a precarious position. Mark Antony loved her as a woman rather than like a queen or whatever, okay. But they also play acted as gods just like she and Caesar did. So I don't, the narrative just didn't give me a reason to root for them. Although I will say when they were fighting their last battle and he like died before her, that did get me a little bit. Just had had to pop in and interrupt myself because she got lost in the Caesar glow. <laughs> I needed to put that out there that the book didn't do enough to make me root for Antony and Cleopatra. Do I think it was worth the 950 pages? Yes. For me, this was worth it. I enjoyed the journey. I enjoyed learning about ancient Egypt and Cleopatra. I will say toward the end, um, I start my interest did start to wane because with Cleopatra and Antony being together, they were fighting Octavian, now known as Augustus. A lot of the like battle stuff that happened and the strategy of the battles was less interesting to me than Cleopatra's like day-to-day -day running of Egypt and her meeting with other leaders of countries to talk about power, to talk about alliances. Who would I recommend this to? I would only recommend this to someone who is really interested in Cleopatra or really really interested in historical fiction and is willing to put in the time knowing that this is going to be a commitment. In the end I'm giving this four stars out of five. I enjoyed it greatly. I think that my instincts for an author I will like are good. <laughs> And honestly, at the end when Cleopatra, like the way this is written, that at the end when Cleopatra does get to, you know, use the poison against herself and mar Octavian's victory by taking herself away, you feel the same like relief for her. I was listening to it in the car. I think that if I had been listening to it anywhere else, I might have cried. At the end, I listened to the author's note on audio and Margaret George, of course, you know, researching and writing this kind of novel is just insanity. And it would, it took a very long time for her to write. The author's note really got me though, because the last paragraph, Margaret George talks about how she has been fascinated with Cleopatra since she was a small child. And she says, I have waited 40 years to write this book. And the very last sentence is, it has been my privilege to spend the last four years almost exclusively in Cleopatra's presence and I leave her side reluctantly. Like, as someone who just spent, you know, the f 20 days with Cleopatra and reading this book and being immersed in that world, like that author's note actually hit harder than Cleopatra's demise because I was like, yeah, you're right. I do leave her side reluctantly. I, I did like this world. I did enjoy this book and especially the ending that she came to. Yeah, that author's note got me a little bit, especially as a writer when you spend so much time with these characters and building them up, like, I get it. I also think that this book was like slyly funny. Cleopatra, like the voice that Margaret George gave to Cleopatra was so 
intelligent and witty and a little bit sarcastic. Will I read Margaret George's other works? Yes, because I have all of them right here. So let's just do a quick accounting of her works, right? That I read by her was Helen of Troy. Fantastic. This is what sent me on this Margaret George journey. She has a book about Mary Magdalene. It's Mary called Magdalene. She has a book about Elizabeth I. She has a book about Mary Queen of Scots. And the book that she really got the most famous for was the autobiography of Henry VIII. I think this might've been her first book. Yeah, this was published in 1986. And I read an article that said that this was so interesting or so groundbreaking because it was heavily detailed with its research and because no one had really written a biography of or anything about Henry VIII that was like sympathetic. And then one of her newest books is The Confessions of Young Nero. And what's interesting about this is that it is only about 500 pages. This might be the shortest one and it's her newest, but I think they may have just split the story into two books because the only book I don't have is The Splendor and Dark and I'll put it on the screen. And that is the sequel to this. So I have a lot more big books to get to. Will I get to them this year? Probably not. This was like a historical fiction big book. Maybe I should do a fantasy big book next or do they have romance big books? I'm sure they do. Let me know what I should read next in this big book series. Is there a big book that you like? I mean, the Sarah J Maas books are pretty big and I haven't read this yet. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you enjoyed it, you could like or subscribe to me. But really, you can do whatever you want. And I'll see you next time.